Hey there, and welcome to another episode of The Clutter Corner. I am super excited that you guys have joined me today, and I have joining us today a behavioral scientist, Sharon Roth. Now, the reason that we have her on our show today is because a couple of weeks ago, we did an episode that we streamed to a couple of our channels, and it was called Clutter Paralysis. And from that one show, we had lots and lots of questions that came in. And it was heartbreaking to me when I read the comments and I listened to the sadness that people who have kind of taken a look now at this part of their lives, they've, they've either retired and they feel like maybe I'm not as useful as I once was, or maybe their identity was tied up in the role that they had at work. And now that that role is gone, they feel like that's who I was and now who am I? And so they've replaced the feeling of who they are and their identity with stuff. And so over the last few years, we've had lots of people that have purchased things online. And as they purchase things online, it's like, hey, I brought stuff into my life. This is who I am now. But they didn't get rid of the old stuff. And so now their houses have kind of accumulated with lots of things. Not that they have any problems wrong with them. It's just that they're creative people or they were looking for a way to reinvent themselves. And for some reason or another, now they're stuck with a whole lot of stuff. And they're like, whoa, wait a second. It just got out of hand. What do we do? And so I've invited Sharon to join us today on the show. And this is the beginning of a 12-part series that we're doing to take a deeper look at really what are the next steps in our journey and our relationship with stuff. So Sue, uh, Sharon, thank you so much for joining me today. Jump in and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you came to be in the space of helping people through those retirement years. Yes, thank you, Angela. I'm 75 and I brag about it. And I have um, struggled with who am I in retirement somewhat. My my main hot button was I started kind of bouncing off the walls and say, how do I know if I'm productive? There's no boss to say, oh, you're doing a good job. Yeah, get this done, you know. I became the boss and nobody told me. That's a whole new revelation of I'm I I'm the one that calls the shots of how I spend my days. And you know, that structure of not having that job anymore and a task to do, a team to work with, or a ta um um something that makes you feel productive, of, oh, I contributed this or that or another thing. There's nobody or no thing to contribute to unless you have grandkids that might enter into it. But I um, I actually grew up on a farm in eastern Washington. I'm north of Seattle. And um, I've always had a hot button for potential. And as a teenager, is my potential. What's the mystery of, you know, why am I here? And yet um, I... Uh, I wanted to become invisible because there was abuse happening in our home and I didn't want to be seen. So I actually kind of made a vow. I must have said a hundred times, thank heavens he keeps his hands off me. Well, I realize now, you know, years later, even though I've dealt with some of that uh, recovery work, um, I'm realizing I'm still struggling with feeling visible. Well, now I want to be visible, and yet there's this trauma in the background that maybe needs some more solution. Anyway, I stacked hay, um, uh, milked cows, and gathered eggs on the farm, and I was the only one in my family that that was a lifelong learner. So I, you know, dove into having a good career, being diligent and being responsible and all this. But um, I'm I'm still learning about who Sharon really is and loving her on many different levels. And what a difference that's making. Well, and I love the fact that you bring that up, because one of the topics that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks is having those really tough conversations and learning to love yourself. And in, in a perfect world, other people would love us, right? I think we all are hardwired to have the need for love, mm -hmm. but yet when some people try to love us, we block them off and we say, no, 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 I don't love myself. Therefore, I'm not giving you permission to love me back. 
you couldn't uh, love me if you really knew me. <laughs> but the reality is we have to give ourselves permission. Okay, I, I want to stop and I want to add a disclaimer here. And I think this comes based on what you just said. I'm going to completely agree with you. I think it comes from if we are going to find purpose in, in our lives and we're going to let other people in to love us and that we are going to let other people notice us, that we have to first give ourselves permission, number one, to be loved and to be noticed. And so if somebody wants to reach out to us, instead of saying, no, no, I got this. Uh, no, no, don't come over to my house. My house is a little messy. We have to be willing to say, you know what, warts and all, come on over. My home is open. I welcome you in. I accept myself for who I is, who I am, and I accept you to accept me back. Would that would that be a fair thing to say? Yeah, that's so real. I, I don't want to invite very many people in. Um, mainly when I first got my condo, um, by the time they moved it all out for me to come in, there was all kinds of spots on my carpet. And I'm kind of sensitive to my flooring. And um, and yet, when I went to start making plans to replace it, a good friend of mine um, was in dire need of paying some rent in Texas. And I sent a chunk of money to her instead of replacing my carpet. So I'm it's still there 10 years later, you know, but let me mention right up front when you say, well, having people into your home kind of, I make these art blocks and vulnerability is the willingness to show up or have others show up and see them and see you without any guarantee of the outcome. Vulnerability, being willing to show up and be seen. And yet we let go of the expectations and the outcome. To me, vulnerability is I am willing to uh, put out a truth about me like I just did and invite you to do the same. I live to tell about it. I didn't die. I didn't croak. I didn't get sick. I didn't get a headache. But um, my being willingness to be seen invites you to do the same. And that is a huge, both risk and courageous and tell it like it is. Um, I, I'm i still struggling with that a little bit in inviting people in. And yet I remember a time or two in dreams that I wanted to be able to stand at my front door, open it and welcome people in. And that hasn't really happened yet. So um, that will probably be in my future. <laughs> well, you're, you're aware and being aware lets you have choices. And I know over the last several years, you've been working with people that are in this space where they too have been ashamed or afraid or things have happened in their lives that they either refuse to deal with or they're not ready to deal with them yet. What is your experience on helping somebody move from a space of, I'm not really ready to face that yet, or I don't know how to move forward. What, what is your, your suggestion there on how to go from here to there? Well, I was just in a uh, conference meeting uh, a little bit ago this morning, and they mentioned how you have to first feel safe. And I actually have a friend, I'm not remembering who exactly it was, but I remember her telling me a little bit about um, loving this lady that was a hoarder and um, carefully, safely, um, cautiously encourage her. I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to be there for you. I'll help you along the way. I think it took six months for them to together do the cleaning that needed to be done. And as she told me about it, I, I felt that deep, caring, loving a reality to get that close to somebody to help them in a tangible, I don't know that it was daily, but um, there was, I mean, you know, there's a term there for the grace of God, go I. And, and she was living that with her friend and for her friend to be courageous enough to receive that, just like we mm -hmm. have to be courageous to receive love. You know, I, I've always, I've never married and never had kids. And yet over the years, I wanted somebody to cherish me. Oh, that I would be cherished. And 
it was just two, three years ago that I said, Sharon, you, you could cherish yourself. Start there. And um, it was a nice revelation that, oh, yeah, I don't have to wait for somebody out there. I can cherish myself. A lot of that comes with self-care and keeping things or ha getting to places that are clean and um, enjoyable. It starts with self-care. Mm -hmm. And so many of us um, haven't done a good job of that. That's a really important part that you bring up. And in the process of us accepting others in. I want to stop for just a second and I want to say hi to everybody that showed up today. You guys, I'm so excited that you showed up. I'm looking at our, our welcome group here. We've got Fran from joining us from Arizona. Hi, Fran. Good to see you again. I've got Melanie Parker. She says, good day from McAllen, Texas. We've got folks from all over. This is so awesome. Tony says, accumulation, next steps. Yes, yes, that's what we're talking about. Uh, Tony says, 1948. Yes. <laughs> and Tony also says Eastern Washington, me too. So you guys might maybe neighbors, who knows? Uh, Pauline says, hi, I found you guys. So hi, you back, Pauline. It's great to have you here. <laughs> I just love this. This is so much fun. Ariabella says, happy to be here. Good morning from Utah. I was born and raised in Utah. So hello back. This is awesome news. Uh, Muppet 99, uh, 929 says, yay, live stream. You guys, it's so nice to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I, I want to highlight the fact, and this is something really exciting, when Sharon is talking about accepting yourself and finding a purpose and moving forward, one of the things that she has done personally to move forward and to find a sense of self-worth, she just showed us the, the art cards that she created. And those are quilted. Those are quilted art cards. I've never seen anything quite like that. But how cool is that? She's also a published author. And as a result of using her creativity, uh, Sharon, tell us about this book. This is awesome. Well, this, I, I did some podcasts myself. Um, and uh, since I have a strong bent for both potential and purpose, our lives are so much richer when we live from our unique, deep purpose. We are healthier. We are happier and we live longer. And um, so this this is kind of a step towards my core uh, course that I have. Uh, I'm launching here even this afternoon. But purpose, essence, I've changed the word essence, started using um, inner spark instead of essence, because essence kind of relates to a lot of things. And we don't necessarily know, do we have an essence? <laughs> but fulfillment, we definitely want. I... Uh, but these art blocks are scattered throughout my book because it actually uh, our our brain processes things differently when there's when there's beauty and um, so in exploring the possibilities kind of as a subtitle to that and that's kind of what we're starting to do here with Angela's uh, group and the um, purpose is a, kind of a, a match between what you're good at. And what you love to do and what your dreams are. A lot of us have given up on dreams, haven't we? You know, what makes us happy? Oh, um, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's, start, it's time to listen to your heart. Uh, Fresh Courage uh, phrase came from a Hallmark movie that said, um, they had a line in the movie that says, often when you go home from a vacation, you often go home with fresh courage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember going home with fresh courage because you've been out in the in nature. You've been out in the big blue sky. You've been out with um, beauty, uh, forest, um, ocean. And um, now some of those things that you knew ne needed attention, you've got the courage to do something about because you've just been revived. And it's time that we recognize both what we love and what we love to do and realize that's your purpose for still being here. Oh, I love that. That's such a great message. I have a question here from Nanette and she says, hi from Florida. Without children, do you worry about being alone in old age? I do. 
I don't because I have a purpose, but I have a message for people who are living alone and without kids because our retirement is very different from everybody else's. You know, there's not grandkids pulling on our shirt. Come to my event help me celebrate my birthday. Can I go on vacation with you? It doesn't happen. It's not there. And I, I do am concerned. I never worry. I, I claim my, that's fear talking, but, um, my, my sister still lives. Um, I have two sisters in Moses Lake and, I ponder sometimes about maybe I should move closer to them because they're 200 miles away. Um, should I need some assistance? Um, I've got a friend or two here in town that I could call on, but there is some concern about that. But um, just actually, I've started, I'm trying to get better about asking the universe or asking God, how can there, what's the, what's the possibilities, explore the possibilities of what can be um, the, the advantages of being without grandkids and living alone. And, if I uh, hear, if I hear you correctly and what I'm seeing from your example, and this is this, you guys that are watching this, this is pure leadership by example. What we have here is somebody who doesn't have children who doesn't have the grandkids saying, hey, come support me at this event. What, what Sharon has done with her life is she said, wait a second, what do I have to give? Instead of giving that to a family because she doesn't have the family nearby, what she's done is she's found a sense of purpose. She wrote a book and now she's reaching out on podcasts and through courses to help other people going through similar situations. And I love that because this is a message that says, wait a second, I do have a purpose. I am worth whatever, all the years of experience that I have gathered, all of the education that I have, everything that I've learned up until this moment in time has brought me to this exact moment right now. And I want to, I want to, I want to serve this moment right now. Let me share this with you. And I love this moment right now. Here's how this works. Everybody that's on this call right now is probably in a slightly different place in their life. Maybe we have some similarities and what we have that's the most similar is we're all on this call right now, right? We all arrived on this call in this exact moment in time. How did we get here? Well, some of us came through different avenues of life and what have you, but yet here we all are. We all arrived at the exact same destination, regardless of our path that brought us here. And so I, I love this fact because here we are sharing this moment together. And what Sharon is telling us, if I'm hearing her correctly, is it's okay however you got here. Now that you're here and now that you're aware, what are you going to do next? And instead of sitting there wallowing in my, oh, maybe I don't have anything left to offer because I'm retired, or maybe I don't have anything left to offer because my house is cluttered and I'm busy or I'm disorganized or whatever, Sharon is saying, no, 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 start with whatever, wherever you are and use the talents and the God-given gifts that you have to make something of yourself and to reach out to other people because who knows, who knows where your mes message will go. And I wanna share this with you about Sharon's book. And I've left links in the notes below to Sharon's book so you guys can pick up a copy. But what is cool about Sharon's book is this, when you are an author, you will write a book and your book will go places you will never go. It will meet people you will never meet and mm -hmm. it will touch the hearts of people you will never get to speak with. And I love the fact that Sharon has dedicated this part of her life where she could be sitting around just watching TV and watching the Real Housewives of whatever city, <laughs> eating corn chips or whatever, and, you know, enjoying the day. She's, she's dedicated this part of her life to making a difference. And what's really graceful about this particular time of life is that no one, no one can take this away, right? The books that people have already bought of Sharon's, those books are out there in the universe. And they, like I said, they'll go places she will never go. But what's really cool about that is they will touch the lives of people she will never meet. And so as a mission, as a message, she's saying, don't waste what you have. Don't be so swallowed up and, oh, you know, I don't want my friends to come over because my house is, is cluttered or what have you, but that you really honor these moments because these are the moments that define you. Right now, everything that you've ever done in your whole entire life brings you to this moment right now. What are you going to do with it? Yes. And even this morning, the speaker I heard, she said, I've given the example of on my patio, I have a 
a ground cover pot that I struggle keeping it alive. And one day I was coming out to water it and I thought, oh yeah, if this plant isn't growing, it's dying. Yeah. Well, this lady this morning used a, a more discreet word. She said, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. Mm -hmm. So in retirement, I could imagine a lot of people are shrinking. And that's, you know, I plan to live to 100. And I, that doesn't include shrinking in my vocabulary. But I'm going to show you. Well, in fact, um, one of the... I did this um, speech in Phoenix um, the end of September and, and my name on my program was um, making a marvelous transition into retirement. And this little koala says, um, uh, the moment that you realize you're getting old, well, my, my hair is changing a lot and I'm starting to consider maybe I'm getting old. But on the other side of this, what I want to show you, and you might want to take a picture of this because this is kind of my secret sauce um, in the helping you find your inner spark is taking what you love to do, plus your personal qualities, things like integrity and responsibility and that kind of thing. Then consider your hot buttons. What really turns you off or turns you on, negative or positive, your aspirations would be those dreams I mentioned. And our values make a lot of difference about what brings us meaning. And then, you know, what are some guiding principles that you've lived your life on? And we, we um, muddle that all together in some kind of um, antidote or um, I, I think of the parables in the Bible as being a uh, metaphor. That's the word I want. And um, the it, when I first discovered my inner spark, we were in a cl coaching class and the um, instructor had us stand in a circle and read our inner spark to each other. And as I was came my turn, I... I kind of choked at first. I, it was it moved me to tears because um, nobody had ever asked me to describe what felt like my soul. Here's my inner spark. I am precious jewel of wisdom. I am colorful collaborator, motivator, and learner. I am tranquil, authentic, and pure inspirer. I light fires and maybe I'll light your fire today. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I love that you articulated it because until we articulate exactly what it is that we think about ourselves, we can't articulate it to someone else. And if we have a mission, which we do, and I know we do because we're all still alive, right? You're still alive. You have a mission. And so if you don't know what your mission is or you don't know what your purpose is, it's because you probably just haven't articulated it yet. And I think one of the most interesting and fascinating ideas is to stop and say, how do I really feel about this concept? Like, what is my inner spark? Like what Sharon is saying. And I know for me, the time came back uh, 33 years ago. I went through the same exercise and I was like, wait a second, how do I feel about life? Because I grew up also on a farm, but I was given a set of beliefs. Like, hey, in our family, we believe this. And I was like, oh, okay, that's what we believe. And I didn't question it until I moved away from home. And then I'm like, hey, wait a second. There's stuff going on out here in the other world that I didn't know about that that doesn't fit into my little pattern of belief. And so is it true? Is it false? Like, what do I really believe? And I started looking at everything that my parents taught me. One of the things, unfortunately, was my parents did not believe in sugar. And when I moved out into the world, I was like, wait a second, I'm learning about ice cream and all kinds of fun stuff. Do I really believe in that? And I was like, oh, yeah, I do. And the reason <laughs> the reason they didn't believe in it was because, you know, of the weight gain and the diabetes and all the things that are associated with that. And I had to learn the hard way. I put on a, a, a ton of weight the first year I lived away from home. And then I was like, oh, wait a second. Maybe I should rethink that idea. Maybe mm -hmm. mom and dad weren't so far off their rocker. Mm -hmm. That might have been a good belief. Let me go back to the way it was. Okay. But by questioning it, I got to explore and I got to say, is this what I believe? And then I was like, oh, wait a second. Not, not a good belief. Let me back up a couple of steps. 
But I did that with all different kinds of areas of my life. And then I found myself in this weird state of questioning everything like, hey, is this good or is this bad? Or is, do I believe this? Do I still believe it? And what I discovered for me, and this goes back to what is that inner spark? Because I had hit a particular phase of my life where I was in a serious state of post-traumatic stress disorder. And it was from a business that went bad. I took ownership of a business that had 10 years of employee withholding taxes that had not been paid. And when I took ownership of that business, the IRS came at me with like mad force. <laughs> I started questioning everything. Okay. But during that process, what I learned was everything that brought me to this moment, if we go back to that perfect moment in time, everything that brought me to this moment makes me who I am today. Mm -hmm. And so if I didn't like it, that doesn't make it wrong. That doesn't make it bad. It means it brought me to who I am today with yes. the understanding that I have today. Okay, cool. Now, if I could start my life all over again right now, knowing what I know now, would I do it any differently? That's where it gets interesting. My answer was, yes, I would. Okay, so what would I do? And I started writing down because I didn't know what would my life look like? Well, it would be this, 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 and this. And I wrote it down just like Sharon did with her spark statement. I wrote mine down and I said, how on earth am I going to remember this? And, and Sharon memorized hers. It was eloquent. So thank you for sharing that with us. I put mine on a cassette tape. This is back in the days where we had the cassette tapes and I recorded it and I listened to it every night as I went to mm -hmm. sleep mm -hmm. and I broke down my life into 12 different areas. And I only broke it down into 12 areas because there are 12 months out of the year. And so I said, there's a mental wellness and an emotional wellness and a spiritual wellness and a financial mm -hmm. wellness. What if I focused for one whole month on learning how I really feel about those different areas of my life? And then I made the statements. I'm like, I am. And then I would state as if I'd already accomplished those. Like mm -hmm. I am financially secure. I am debt free. I am able to pay all of my bills on time. And I would listen to that over and over and over as I went to sleep at night. And the reason that I did that was because I wanted to, it's like making a Google search. When I search for something on Google and I say how to become financially free, uh, financially free or debt free, it says, did you mean this? And it pops up an article. Did you mean this? And it pops up a second article and maybe a video and something else and something else. Did you mean this, 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 there's a, and, and you start narrowing down what it means to you. And what I started doing was saying, wait a second, when I'm asking stuff of myself, I'm, I'm narrowing down my choices so that as I'm out there living my life, things are coming at me from all directions. Did you mean this? Did you mean this? Did you mean this? Did you mean, and I'm going to recognize what I'm looking for, just like the Google search. I'm going to go, wait a second. That's what I'm looking for. The debt free thing. I've been telling myself that every day. That's what I'm looking for. Right. And so by having the statement, and I, I think this is one of the most powerful things that if you come away from anything today, if you don't have a spark statement like the one that Sharon just shared with us, please stop and create one. What does what does your life stand for? What is the purpose of your life? Because moving now through forever, if you had that memorized and you could call that on instant recall, everything that happens in your life will be directed by that. Is this what you're looking for? Did you mean this? Did you mean this? Did you mean this? And if it's all the things that are part of that spark statement, when it runs up against you, you're, you're going to spark. You're going to go, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. That's exactly what I've been telling myself. I recognize that now as mine. That's mine. I created that, right? Thank you for sharing that with us, Sharon. That's that's beautiful. Wow. Thank you. I want to share with you too the... The metaphor that I used for I am precious jewel of wisdom was kind of one of those magical moments. I'm impressed at how much clarity you had about your wisdom and, and reflecting often. You made a habit. I don't think us in the U.S. here are very good about reflecting. Do we ever do that <laughs> in school? How did we learn that? But I was in Dallas, Texas. I lived there for 12 years. And um, there was the first weekend of May, which we just passed. Um, they had uh, a May fair around the Cowboy Stadium. And I went kind of late because it was, I, I remember it being Sunday afternoon, but way back in the back corner was this um, tent of a guy who made um, uh, rings. Uh, he, uh, I, forget the name of oh, Trisco rings is what it was. And he, he was a geometry teacher 
turned jeweler. Well, I love unique things and people are pretty unique. You know, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. But um, when I, he had what he called stackables and, and when I put his rings on my finger, something moved in my gut. What, what happened? I took them off and put them back on and it moved again. I was bewildered. I was shocked. What just happened? And I slowly walked away. And um, on my dream board is some Trisco rings. And I, I, I have to ask, were the Trisco rings on your board before you were at the fair? I'd never heard of this guy before. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, it was just one of those unique moments and uniqueness is so precious to me. But I later in my career, I used those rings as to describe how I contributed to my teammates and my job. Mm -hmm. You know, the the value, the brilliance, the quality, the um, reliability. Um, I, I, I describe myself as representing rings. Well, so when it came to writing our essence statement, our inner spark, I decided to use those rings again. And um, so it's kind of a little bit presumptuous, but I am precious. Who, who says where they are? Well, I do. I say I'm precious. I, I am living that model life as for others. And I'm starting just in the last three, four months realizing what a model I am because I'm pretty healthy, even without kids or a husband. And, um, you know, life is pretty good. But um, precious jewel. So the rings are the jewel. And I've always loved wisdom. Um, I, I like to read books and, and copy down nuggets of um wisdom that I can share with people because that's basically what I do on my blocks. Like uh, here's one for, for in retirement, you're the boss now that nobody tells us. Um, it's something that's been missing from our education. Um, let's see, uh, taking good, let's, let's talk about self-care. Taking care of yourself takes care of more than yourself. That's the sweet spot. And that I picked up from Matthew McConaughey. And taking care of yourself is like putting on your uh, air oxygen on the airplane before you put it on your children. So that's how important loving yourself is. When you love yourself, you're also taking care of your family and your friends and making the world a better place. So the metaphor, I, I worked with a lady in Tennessee that used a maple tree that was kind of special to her as she was growing up. And so she described herself as the big leaves and the strong uh, trunk and the uh, beauty and the shade that she added to the world because of who she was. Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay, now I've got to ask about the art blocks. Do you sell these or how? I do. I do. They haven't so a lot on but i do have a store on etsy called quilted petunia i love raise growing petunias and geraniums on my on my patio here and um here's if you wonder what you should be doing in retirement and you don't have any idea where to start well this is a simple little baby step do what you did in your career for charity so if you were a pilot and um uh, you're not flying airplanes for, you know, commercial. Well, find some products or people who need delivering someplace. If you're being counter, find somebody who needs some accounting done. That's I. Oh, that's awesome. That's that's using the God-given skills that you have and using them in a different way. And I love that. I, I absolutely love that. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you mentioned in your studies the dark side of retirement. What is the dark side of retirement? And can you share that with us as we're on this journey? We don't talk about it, do we? Suicide, depression, alcoholism is a real thing in retirement. You know, all those lonely days and all this pandemic we've been through and bouncing off the wall and who cares about me and all that drives us often to depression and depression leads to loneliness or maybe the vice versa. Um, 
often our coping method, me, um, method is um, alcohol or drugs or um, sleeping all day, maybe. And um, can I, I can just, I add in there the internet? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other thing that one of the things that's driving me is not as serious, but uh, in the book, What Retirees Want, I've got a sleeve of it here, but this is kind of a research book, but I used it for writing my book. He said that 47, 48, you know, 47 or eight hours a week, retirees are using watching TV. That is a waste of potential. That is, un all this time freedom is an untapped potential. And that drives me to my message because um, there is so much good in the world that we can do, even if it's just baking cookies for your neighbor. You know, putting a smile on somebody's face can be kind of simple. Uh, walking around the block in your neighborhood once a day is a, is a baby step towards being outdoors and soaking it, you know, drinking in that, that pure sort of pure oxygen is <laughs> clean or dirty as it is. But, um, but yeah, untapped potential that went all the way back to my teenage years is um, driving me to help boomers repurpose their education. Those things that, what was it? Your education has not been taken away from you. Your experience all through these many, many years, um, the vacations you've been on, I, I still want to do um, international travel. And um, I actually am in the process of applying to be a cruise ship speaker so I can travel and share my message with people. And um, so that, that untapped potential is what I'm here to put into motion and repurpose. Um, I love what you said a minute ago about getting out and going for a walk. And I, I like that for a couple of reasons. And I want to stop on that for just a second, because when we're talking about finding our inner spark and finding our purpose, one of the best things that I, I'm hearing Sharon say, as well as based on the experience of people that I've worked with over the years, is that if you will get out at the top of the day and you will go for a walk, not just to walk your dog, it gives your dog exercise if you have a dog. And if you don't just get out and go for a walk yourself. But what happens then is it gets a bunch of oxygen flowing through your body and it gets your blood flowing. And all of a sudden you start breathing differently than you did if you were just sitting at home watching TV. In addition to getting out and walking, what happens if you get out and you start enjoying some sunshine and some fresh air, all of a sudden your thoughts start to process. And so where I was talking about, you know, taking a good look at is what I'm doing in my life working for me right now. All of a sudden you start having thoughts that are coming through that you're like, hey, wait a second, I could be doing things differently. In addition to that, if you're out walking a dog or if you're out walking in the neighborhood, chances are you're going to run into other people. Now, Sharon said it's nice to get out there and put a smile on your face. I'm going to take it one step further and I'm going to give you a challenge. And your challenge is for this week. This is your homework for this week. In addition to creating your spark statement, I want you to get out and I want you to do this. This is your homework. You must greet one new person every day. If you come across them, meet one new person every day. This is a test that my humanities teacher gave me way back. I went to one year of public high school. It's homeschooled the rest of the time. And when I went to one year of public high school, my humanities teacher took me aside and she said, man, you're really shy. And I said, I know. I'm really scared to be around other people because like, I don't have the cool clothes and all the cool stuff that they have. She said, I want you to do me a favor. Can you do me a favor? And I said, yes. She said, can you promise me you'll do me this favor? And I said, yes. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> she said, will you meet one new person a day? And I said, what, what does that mean? She said, that means you have to say, hello, how are you? And start an organic conversation. You can't just go up and, you know, write it off the list and say, oh, I saw someone. You have to go up and start a conversation, introduce yourself and say something like, hey, how's the weather? Don't you love, don't you love how, how nice it is today or lovely dog or how long have you had the dog or whatever? You got to make an organic conversation. And I said, why do I have to do that? She said, do it and then you'll know. And I said, okay. And I said, what happens if I go for a day and I don't run into anyone? She said, then you have to make it up. On another day where there are two people, you got to go talk to two people to make up for the day that you missed. And I said, okay. 
So I get out of my shell. I go out there and I start meeting new people. And I started in the school that I was in, starting organic conversations with people. And I realized the most amazing thing. Mm -hmm. People are not scary. <laughs> they don't bite back. They're like normal. And most people are grateful that someone else started a conversation yes. because they themselves are scared to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so instead of us all wandering aimlessly through life, kind of like, oh, I saw that person and we made eye contact. Oh, how uncomfortable. I'm going to hurry off like nothing happened. To stop and go, wow, check it out. I'm going to share this with you. Wherever you are, the other person is also there in that exact same moment. They're also there. So you can say things like, what brings you here today? Are you here on business or pleasure? Especially if you're on a cruise ship. Hey, what brings you here? Are you the guest speaker? Or are you here just enjoying the, the time with your family? Are you celebrating a birthday or an anniversary? These are organic conversations you can start. If you're out walking the dog and they're out walking their dog, you can say, hey, do you always walk your dog in this neighborhood? How long have you had the dog? Whatever you're doing right then, the other person that you're running into, they have something in common with you right now in that exact same space. However, both of you got here is two completely different avenues, yet here you are in the exact same moment in time. Are you both seeing the same moment in time or are you seeing it two, from two completely opposite perspectives? And so by just stopping and saying, hey, what a lovely day, right? And then having a small conversation, it doesn't hurt anything and it helps more than you will ever know. And I'll share this with you. Had it not been for that one exercise alone, I would never have been in a position to have a conversation like the one I'm having right now with Sharon. I would have never had the courage. I would have never said, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm worth something that a behavioral scientist that has been in this industry for 30 years is willing to come on my show and share her ideas with me. I would have never asked for that. And we have to be willing to ask. We have to be willing to say, hey, I'm putting myself out there in order for people to say, hey, I'm willing to come be part of what you're doing. You have to, you have to ask and you have to be honest with yourself. Like, am, am, I, am I okay to do that? And if you're not okay, then ask yourself, what is my spark statement? If my spark statement is I want to help other people, seniors who socialize are happier. Yes, that deserves a happy bell. Let me get a happy bell here. Here's my happy bell. <laughs> Sharon gets my happy bell. You have to be willing to ask for this, right? You've got to be willing to get yourself out there. And if you get out and you go for a walk every single day and you're willing to meet one new person, I promise you this, your life will change and it can only change for the better. That's how we're going to solve the loneliness pandemic right there. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that are here. I want to, okay. I want to share these. Pauline says, wow, that's actually hard. I'm someone who starts conversations randomly. I love that. I love that you start conversations randomly and I hope you do it often. And I hope you do it with all kinds of people that are too scared to start a conversation back. Because even if you get a weird look from somebody like, why are you talking to me? Chances are on the inside, they're probably really happy. Like, oh, wow, someone just started a conversation with me. Like, I I do matter. I am important. I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us, Pauline. Tony says, went to elementary school in Warden, Washington. Is that um, is that near where you are, Sharon? Well, where my sisters are. Yeah. Uh-huh. Very oh. and, like, next door. <laughs> okay. Awesome. And Catherine, Catherine says, absolutely wonderful. Thank you, ladies. This is great, you guys. Um, and um, up at 929 says, I can't have people come over on short notice. I need more time to hide my stuff. What you guys said is making me really stop and think about that. Now, I, oh, wait, let me let me move this here so that we can we can see the full the full card. It says vulnerability, the willingness to show up and be seen without any guarantee of the outcome. Oh, that's beautiful. So Pauline, be be willing to be real with people. It is tough. It is. I mean, I can remember one of my housemates at roommates in Texas. Uh, I remember her hiding things under the bed and so forth. But um, the healing comes with being vulnerable. And you might try it in small doses, like maybe meeting somebody on your porch with a glass of lemonade or something as a baby step to opening that door to um, letting people in. But, you know, the part of this reflecting is uh, I went on a, 
a diet here uh, five or six years ago that was called the wild fit diet. And, and he didn't have us change anything about our diet, but he made us pay attention to how food made us feel. So in your story, Angela, about n noticing how the food put on weight, that's, that's reflecting on what happened when I did that. Well, when you meet somebody on the porch with lemonade, um, you might feel some new feelings. I know I was, went for a walk one day when I was feeling just a little bit down. And I said, well, maybe I'll feel better when I come back home. Sure enough, I met at least one or two people on my walk and Oh, look, I do feel better. I, I, I want to highlight that and I want to honor that because that is a really important step that Sharon just shared with us. And that's doing what we call an energy check. And I like to stop at any given moment throughout the day. And I like to stop and do an energy check and do exactly that. How am I feeling right now about this? And I know sometimes I, I get flustered because as a CEO, I have employees and sometimes they pull shenanigans. I know you don't think that they would, but they do sometimes. And I sit there and I'm like, why is this happening? And then I get a little, you know, anxious and stressed out and things start happening in my head where like maybe I start to get like a little, you know, not, not so peaceful. What is it that just triggered? What just happened? Why am I feeling this way? Why do I feel uncomfortable in this situation? Is it because somebody did something that, that maybe they did the wrong way because I say the wrong way, like they didn't do it my way. But if we get to the same outcome, was it really the wrong way? Mm -hmm. And so am I flustered because they didn't do it my way or am I flustered because I'm not willing to give them the latitude to do it their way? And sometimes when I walk myself through what are these anxious feelings, I realize the anxious feelings are my own limitations screaming out at me. You hired people to do this job so don't show up and do it for them, okay? Let them make the mistakes or let them come through the creativity and show you what they can do, right? You hired them, honor that by letting them do the job they're supposed to do. And so by sometimes doing an energy check, I realize, wait a second. What I thought a second ago was, I got to change this whole thing. This is not working. What I realize is, wait a second, I need to change myself because this is not working. And when I change myself and I go, oh, wait a second, this is one less thing you have to do. You hired them to do it and now they're doing it. Get out of their way and let them do it. And then I'm like, oh, wait a second, I'm okay now, right? I just talked myself off a ledge of being like, ah! What I realized in this exact moment is I was actually okay, I'm, I'm okay with, with this happening, right? Some of the things that we feel like we don't really understand or you know, we're, we're doing our own, our own anxiety over. Sometimes it's because we don't know how we feel about that situation. And what Sharon is sharing with us is if you'll stop and you'll just have a little conversation with yourself, like, Hey, wh why do I feel this way? How does this make me feel? And then those moments where you're like, wow, this makes me feel awesome. Somebody, you know, picked up the slack and they took something off my plate and they did it for me. And yay, that's awesome. My anxiousness and my anxiety can turn into this moment of sheer joy. That's why I outsourced it in the first place. Wait a second. Let me have my happy bell back, right? There's my happy bell for somebody doing what they were paid to do. <laughs> so I love the, I love this inner awareness because imagine as we go through our states of clutter and our states of hoarding and all the stuff that we've collected in our lives, we, we bought it for a reason, right? Why did we buy it? Yeah, I, the thing that's coming to mind for me, Angela, now is um, how we really hang on what we can control. You know, part of your, you know, you, you gave it to somebody else and then you want to take the control back. Well, maybe like I had an aunt that was a hoarder and um, I often think about even um, a Carpent, Karen Carpenter and how her eating was something she could control. Mm -hmm. it, it turned deadly for her, but sometimes when our world is out of control, we grasp, or, well, what can I control, you know? And maybe all this stuff that we collect is something connected with controlling. Uh, that might have been part of what my aunt's issue was. I don't know. Um, she she would find something she like, oh, it was on sale. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I like sales a lot, but she would buy five or six of the same thing because it was on sale. You know, mm -hmm. she was spending money to save money. So there's all kinds of things, especially as women, when we've been controlled by many, many people, um, you grasp for what what's mine that I can control. So would you be willing to consider whether some of things that have have turned negative in your life is because you were hanging on to something that you control. And I often think about how as kids, when we, we would act out to get attention, mm -hmm. it was compensating behavior. Well, nobody tells you, you don't need to compensate anymore. Um, you know, so uh, be willing, like Angela said, to uh, review it and see how you feel and why you're still doing that. It may not serve you anymore. I want to stop for a second. Thank you for sharing that with us because that's that's a really a really important lesson. And the quest: Do we need to be in control? Mm -hmm. I just I, I I really like that. That's a really deep thought. Um, I want to share this. This is from Fran. Fran says, while working, I noticed people always sat with coworkers during large meetings. I forced myself to sit near people I didn't know. Mm -hmm. It was scary, but I made so many friends that helped me grow. Good. Now, I love this because this is not somebody that was just willing to show up at the meeting, but somebody that was willing to show up and intentionally go sit by somebody that she didn't know. Now, I love that for so many reasons. And that goes back to our conversation about, do you have to control everything? And she, she put herself in a situation where, no, I, I'm going to go have a conversation with, I don't know, I don't know what the outcome is. I don't know the person that I'm sitting next to. We're going to have a conversation and like what Sharon just said. I, I, I don't know what the outcome is, but I'm going to trust myself that it's going to be okay. And this goes back to what we talked about a couple of weeks ago about learning to trust ourselves. Yeah. Because if we can trust ourselves and we're willing to be it's vulnerable, so there will be bad things that happen to us, okay? I promise that. That's part of life. That's part of living. If you if you are healthy, at some point you will get sick, okay? So there are, there are opposites of everything. And if you're willing to trust, you will be betrayed. You will get your feelings hurt. Somebody will step on that trust at some point. I promise you that. But the majority of life will open up for you because the majority of people will not right? It will happen and there will be isolated cases. So I don't want to promise you roses and, and sunshine, okay? Because there will be some rain, but check it out. When it rains, what do you do? You're like, oh, wow, those days where the sun was out, you appreciate them so much better. And if you're willing to be vulnerable and you're willing to put yourself out there and you're willing to trust and you're willing to sit by people that you don't know, hey, I'm going to strike up a conversation with this perfect stranger. And what do you know? They might teach me something new. Chances are you're going to make a lot of friends. Fran did and ended up with a bunch of friends. How cool is that? Right? Was it worth it? Yeah, it was. You know how I know that? Because she showed up on a podcast or she showed up on a YouTube show right now and she just told us. She wouldn't have told us if there wasn't some kind of happiness that came from that. And how expansive is that when everybody is having the same conversations with the same people, knowing the same stuff? She steps out of her comfort zone and she has this conversation with somebody she doesn't know that's outside her comfort zone that has different information and a different set of viewpoint. All of a sudden, her world just expanded. It just got bigger and better. How cool is that? Anyway, thanks, French, for sharing that with us. And thank you, Sharon, for, for triggering that whole conversation. That was awesome. Cool. Cool, cool. Okay. Okay. Melanie says, I did a lot of interest education with multidisciplinary teams. I would often start sessions with some kind of an icebreaker that forced people to talk to somebody that wasn't in their particular department. Oh, I love that. And I'm going to share this with you. If you are in a situation where you have groups that you're dealing with on a regular basis, maybe you are doing um, uh, Facebook groups or you're doing chat groups or support groups or things like that. One of the things that you can do now, if you're using chat GPT, I know lots of, uh, many of us are now using the new AI, but you can ask a question. Hey, I'm jumping into a group where there are a bunch of people that don't know each other and we're going to be forced to have conversations. Can you give me 10 questions that would be good icebreakers to have with this particular audience and start out each one of those sessions with one of those thought provoking questions like, and it might be something like, 
were you ever in a situation where you were determined to do things one way and something happened where you ended up doing it a different way and what happened? And people will go, oh yeah, there was a time. And then people will share their story with you. What happens when you share your story? And this goes back to what Sharon said earlier about having that, that moment where you're like, wait a second, I'm checking my energy in this moment and I, this is exciting. Mm -hmm. It's that moment where somebody tells you something and it triggers a thought in you and it puts you in touch with your own story. So you're hearing someone else's story and you're like, wait a second, I'm recognizing this, those things that come at you at life. Did you mean this? Did you mean this? Did you mean this? And something hits you and you're like, yes, that's exactly, that's exactly my story. This applies to me somehow, right? So connections are made. Connections are made. And now can you go back to the way you were a minute ago where you're like, oh, I'm not talking to perfect strangers or now because you have a new friend and you have something in common, is it like what Fran did where she sat next to the perfect stranger where now you have something in common and you have a new friend? I started a meetup group where I was looking for clients and uh, right here in town, we called it Edmonds Baby Boomers. And um, I brought one question every week to our coffee meetup. And I was shocked at the 18, 20 people who gave their one, their answer to that one question. Wow. What did we learn from each other? It was yeah. both amazing and surprising at the same time. And um, I thought, and unless I ans asked it, that question, I would have not known something about Angela or Fred or John, you know, um, it was amazing that the different perspectives, that's part of our learning process in life. Well, and I love the fact that Melanie was prepared when she showed up for these department meetings to have those questions already in advance. And I love the fact that if we are prepared, and this is just, you know, put together a couple of quick questions that are short icebreakers that like Sharon did when she showed up at the meeting, she showed up with one question and there were 20 people. Here's what I'm hearing her say. There were 20 people at those meetings that were willing to say, wait a second, I didn't come with a question, but I want to be part of this conversation. And there were 20 people that were like, wait a second, I want to be part of the conversation. They were, they were eager for the question. Right? They were eager to participate. And so I, I love this concept that we're having today about how do you stay relevant? If you are in a situation where you have retired and you've lost your title or you've lost the purpose that you brought to departments or businesses or whatever you did for all the years that you were active, what, what happens now? It doesn't have to end right now because you're officially retired. When we talk about these, these beautiful um, art blocks that Sharon has made and has created. Here's another one. Have you forgotten who you are? I just love these. I've never seen these before. And these are quilted little blocks you could have all over your house, I guess. And um, I, I, I don't I, I use them for teaching. I mean, I can just see so many uses for teachers and for as gifts and oh my goodness, these are just awesome. Um, I, and I've never seen them before. I think they're so cool. I'm gonna leave links to uh, her quilted uh, petunia uh, Etsy store in the notes below, because I've, I've got to get me some of those. Um, but as we wrap up today, because our time is running out, um, thank you so much for joining us, Sharon. This was awesome. Please tell our viewers and our listeners where they can go to learn more about you and to get copies of your book and all that stuff. Well, I have about four pages on uh, Facebook. I have my own page, which I, I'm pretty good about posting something every day. And it's quality stuff or something beautiful, Sharon Rolf at, on Facebook. I have a page called Effortless Vitality because that's my business name. And um, another group called Fresh Courage in Retirement, where it's um, I ask questions or make postings that encourage you. And uh, I have a, a private group called Retirement Well-Being. Um, that it's not as active, but I'm getting ready. I mean, just this last couple of weeks, Angela, I've been cooking on this idea of, of how much of a model I can be to my world in the area of courage on Instagram. I'm queen of courage um, on loneliness, on mental strength and on um, uh, feeling visible. This whole thing of feeling invisible through my life we often feel that in retirement too. So my book is available on Amazon. If you want a autographed copy, I have some here that I'd be 
willing to send to you for um, per, uh, uh, shipping and I think it's um, 1995 on on a book, but I'd, especially some of you from Washington, that would be cool to send it to you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. And I will leave links in the notes below for all the stuff that she just mentioned, because I want to make sure that you guys stay in touch. Also, I want to recommend a couple of things as we wrap up today. In the notes below also, I have two sleep tapes. The two sleep tapes are my versions of the things we were talking about where you have a spark statement and you listen to it over and over again. I want you to create your own, but as you get started, please listen to mine so at least you have one to listen to. It's absolutely free and it will it will help move the needle forward. Again, it doesn't cost anything and it comes from a place of love. I want you to accept yourself for who you are and I want this part of your life to be the best part of your journey. You learned everything in life. You went through all the hard stuff so you could get here right now. And I don't want you to lose this time right now watching TV and eating corn chips. I want you to, to make something of your life and do what, <laughs> do what Sharon has done with writing the books and making the art blocks and all the amazing stuff that she's shared with us today. Because right now, this is, this is the time that defines you. And I want this to be the best part of your life. That's what I wish for you today. So this is it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys for all of your lovely comments. And uh, I, I will meet you guys again here, back here, same time, same place next week. And we'll carry on this conversation. So thank you, Sharon, so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me.